Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And uh, like always, we have a very interesting guest today. And before I uh, bring the guest and introduce the guest to you, uh, you know, uh, you've been following uh, Future Fast. And uh, thank you so much for uh, all your uh, support. And those of you who are here for the first time, I urge you to uh, click on the subscription button and uh, subscribe uh, right away. And uh, today we have uh, Hannah Gabrielova. And I hope I got the name right, Hannah. Uh, so Hannah is uh, an activist uh, in the environment space uh, who also contributes to the policy making and uh, largely been in the hemp space. So, uh, uh, or uh, if I can say the cannabis. So she's been uh, a farmer there and then continues to consult the farmers and the businesses in the cannabis space. So it's wonderful to have you with us, Anna, and thank you so much for making time to be with us here. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to share my 25 years experience with your with your podcast followers. Thank you. Wonderful. So, uh, Hannah, uh, can you just uh, share your uh, your background? You you started off uh, you started off uh, in an administrative job, right, with a government uh, mm -hmm. job, and then you became a activist which is uh, almost a 180 degree shift and then uh, an entrepreneur to uh, an educator so how did this transformation take place uh, simple i i studied agriculture university so my my focus was always like animals farming um, <clears throat> and in the university i took a thesis about industrial hemp so I graduated in 1999, and the time I was already, already like having hemp field and doing some research on that. It's my first hemp field in 1998. And uh, then uh, I, I finished the, the university and started to work closely with the NGO called Konopa in Czech Republic. They were like, doing first hemp exports, hemp fairs. In like 2000, 2001, we did the biggest one, we got some award. So then uh, the chairman of the NGO uh, went to do some family stuff. So I, I became the, the, the chairman of this NGO for like the next five years. At the time I was working in the in the environment space, like I was working on the uranium mining, the craft power plant, waste, uh, for Greenpeace also, like I found some small NGO, like working with the communities who are in the places which was choose for final nuclear storage, depository, very hard, like difficult to explain people, right? So uh, then after like 10 years in this like environment space, I decided to establish my company because it, it was kind of frustrating, like trying to explain people the all weaknesses of the nuclear power. And, uh, and you know, like, central versus the centralization of the, of the nuclear, uh, uh, of the energy gas production. So I decided to establish my company because I, I thought at the time, oh, it's going to be much easier to talk to people about him because the people like it to hear about that. It's always new and positive compared to, like, nuclear waste. It's, like, never positive, right? So... <clears throat> I founded uh, my company in 2010 and start to with the idea to just like sell him stuff from different sources because during my career of the NGO we did a lot of booths and festivals, promotions, selling stuff. It was always difficult because we wasn't a really like profit company. So we always needed to turn the, the profit in the, in the NGO and it was always just like more like a like a funded, like really business, so I couldn't really live with that. Uh, so I, I decided to establish the company and, and buy the products from different people and do 
to, to, to sell them, which wasn't the best idea because uh, for that you need a lot of like cash to buy and store and then sell, <laughs> right? So later on, I started to produce my own products uh, because there was also some gaps on the market that not nobody did, was doing. And I started to grow because uh, the guy who I know from the previous job that he has a like organic farm, he just built a biogas power station, and he was trying to find some something how he can use the waste heat from the biogas power station for some drying or something, yeah. And and the time he started to grow hemp because his mother gets sick so he was like thinking oh i'm going to do some extracts for her unfortunately she died before we harvest the first field but he just finished the the bagas power station and he wanted to, to dry it somehow so we so we used the, the we just like built the dry room and like very small one at the time but we was able to show in the grand opening that we dry something you know which was like big success so later on we expand at the farm in 2015 i moved to the farm with all my company with myself it was like two hours from my home so i needed to move myself too and yeah and i i did farming uh with them on their organic fields it was like many years of organic farms i clean the 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 owner was very conscious person he had like 1,000 pigs, 300 cows, but all organic, all outdoor, like very cool. I really like it. And uh, so we started to, to collaborate. He started to sell our products. Like he, 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 he was like renting the fields from him and, you know, paying him for rent on, on our office at the farm. But in the COVID, it became very like expensive, this kind of job. And also it was difficult to hire people because we was like doing harvesting by hands to, to keep the quality because we was focusing on the flowers for extraction and the tea production, which was still very unique because nobody was doing it by hands. But like the quality was like very different compared to doing the machine. So we had some success, like like some big tea companies reach us because they wanted to high quality. Uh, but then still like the regulation of the RMS, yeah, so somehow it screwed up all the businesses, so we lost some money and we couldn't really like continue doing that. And uh, yeah, in 2018, I also established the Czech hemp, so I had like a lot of like other stuff to do than just like focusing, fighting to raising money for farming, which does not make economic sense, you know, so. Yeah, so here I am, like doing just distribution consulting and working on policies still after 25 years. <laughs> Never ending. Well, uh, you're starting off with a government agency. Uh, did it kind of help you in your uh, activist function? Because at mm. least you had a view of how the government agencies work. Did it really help you that uh, way? Well, I don't think so. Or was um, it the frustration of the way they were got you to become an activist? No, no. Well, maybe. Well, I was working on the government, but the local government, like the town hall of my hometown, just Um I was like working on the department of the the environment protection. The time we had a law, if somebody want to cut tree, they need to ask somebody need to go check it out if it's okay cut this tree or not so it was me going around the town checking trees uh, and giving people a decision if they can cut it or not or if they cut it they have to grow some more new trees something like that yeah i was doing this decision but it was short job just one and a half year and the time i really saw like how government is corrupt even like on the local um, uh, this guy corrupt me. I was like, oh my god, like why, why me? Like, <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I didn't like it. Uh, it was just like, uh, not really 
like I, I try to do my best, but they put it in the on the table. Nobody really look at that, you know. Like I saw that like I can work instead of like three people. You know, and then like my colleague came to work and she was like pissed of me that I was like doing the job instead of her and now like people expecting like to get like decisions by one day and she has like thirty days, so I screw her job. Like really this yeah, I was like, it's not me, like I cannot do that. Like I'm here for people. I wanna serve people and government never serve people, right? Like they serve themselves. I understood. So I was kind of okay, uh I'm out. I am going to find my way, like so I I started to work for NGOs for so uh, how, how did you see the purpose of your better served in an NGO? Because uh, uh, activism, as much as the uh, necessity from a point of influencing the government in making right decisions, it's not a very direct way, right? I mean, particularly in the environmental protection uh, activist. Uh, I get it. But I think it's the only way. Right? Because like like you need to show the government the the like the public public need and then they will do it and uh and this is what i do all my life i'm just actually government public need public need or public feedback like i was like representing government uh public in front of the government um when they was like choosing the the final nuclear depository and there was like six villages where they want to put it and they couldn't represent themselves but I, I had a background and like i was like working with them closely advocating for them so they choose me as a representative so i was like talking to the government behind of them and um uh yeah but like the government they always do own things they don't, they don't so do what were the failures of case. success in this that you uh, personally faced uh, i i succeeded in the in the in the cannabis lobbying in czech republic because in 2010 we started like we did some big seminar for the cannabis patient in in the parliament so so then after the parliament parliament seminar the, the, there was some decision that's okay like we have to do the the, the medical cannabis law Year later, nothing happened. So we we remind them with the petition, sixty thousand signatures, uh, and big uh, press press conference. And day after press conference, uh, press conference, the the chairman of the parliament called us, lady, she's Nemtsova, and she she was a oncologist patient, and she was like, "We need that right now. Let's do it." So in one and a half year from that time he was able to had signed the medical cannabis law well that's then a big success it's a big success but then it took us a lot of time to because law is one thing but then you have always the under regulation on the ministries and they the ministry screwed it up the law so it took us another eight years to get the medical cannabis to the patient I'll, I'll uh, come to that. But uh, are there any failures uh, in the process that, if you look back, uh, uh, must have been right? Because activist life, much of it is failure and very few successes. Mm, yeah, yeah. Probably the failure was that we wasn't like able to really like communicate properly the the law with all the ministries at that time. You know, because then to us longer we thought like ministries works for the government right so the government make laws so you should like implement it but they didn't uh so, so it was like our naive, naive expectation kind of you know uh so now now we are like stronger now we're working on the regulations for the recreation kind of so how does how has that shaped you in the from a point of view today consulting others uh so how how, how much of it has changed your perspective in when you consult uh, to others and tell them how to go about doing it and also with your yeah. uh, foundation yeah it's a good question uh i think 
I goes so much. I, I always work on the on the regulation, right? Like always, right? Last twenty five years, I'm just working on the regulation. It's crazy, never ending story. And even if I will have it done in Czech Republic, I, I go work on the regulations in Nepal, in uh, Peru, in Colombia, in Argentina, in US, like everywhere, yeah? So, uh, because even like we have it done in Czech Republic, because I work internationally, so I work pe with people around the globe, so they're facing the same issues on the cannabis regulations. Cannabis was like banned in 61 without any scientific background. And now, more than 60 years later, we're still facing the problems, you know? So, because there is a scientific background, so there is really nothing like we can oppose, you know? <laughs> it's just political decision. So, um, so kind of diff difficult, yeah. Uh, but I think it turned my uh, focus to, to yeah, advocate not only like for the plant, but also for the people to have rights to access the plant, you know, and, and patients to have rights to have their medical cannabis. So I, I become very like, mm, like human rights, human rights activism kind of. Right. Yeah, but like what was your trigger? Why did you get into, why did you get into this as a, is it because that's what you studied uh, in, in agriculture university? Yeah. Well, I study agriculture university, so my background farming. I wanted to farm hemp, yeah. But when you want to farm hemp, uh, you want to... No, but uh, why hemp? You, what made you pick hemp? Because why you hemp? Done anything why hemp? Else. Yeah, yeah. Why, why hemp? Yeah, good question. Why hemp? Well, hemp, yeah, because I was a smoker, yeah. And I wanted to know more about, like, what I'm smoking, yeah. And one one person gave me the, the book from Jack Herrer, yeah, this, like... Emperor wears no clothes book, yeah. But it's a lot of like explain about this conspiracy, but not really. Yeah. Um, on like why hemp was like bandit and like and, and all the history how it was like used before, and I was like, wow, nobody taught me about that. Why not? So I start to and I was like at the university. I was like, I want to study. I want to know more. Yeah, and. Uh, six, since 15, I was like environmental kind of sensitive person, yeah? I didn't take like plastic bags when I was going shopping and I didn't bought like water in the plastic bottles. I was like crazy about that. I was like vegetarian for my 15, yeah? Because I studied veterinary school and they put me in the slaughter. I wanted to protect animals and they put me in the slaughter. You have to check if the animal is healthy. I was like, what the what the fuck? Like, I, 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 it was like my purpose. So, big disappointment, right? I'm like 15 years old girl, you know. So, so then I start to, you know, like all welfare, with welfare come organic farming, with organic farming come something like how we replace all the fossil fuels and like where we find the natural sources and what can be the good natural sources, the renewable sources. That we can like use and and cannabis become like very versatile plant which can fit in many of our <laughs> nowadays problem as a solution you know medicine uh clothes uh building uh bedding uh plastic paper everything you know so i was like oh that's great i have to like so i just became advocating for for my own kind of mission because i want to survive on this planet right and it does not really go well yeah so uh, uh but like i don't want to like say oh. it so bad yeah but like we don't really like doing well with our like planet protection or like uh, uh, how, how did the check hemp come about hemp check check, check hemp the organization you yeah, started yeah. so what led to yeah, 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 you starting that yeah, because uh, the time I was traveling a lot around the globe, and I decided to also focus on the Czech because I wanted to do something in Czech, and and they didn't have any organization, so lobby as a Hanna Gabriela was like difficult. So you always need some organization for lobbying. Uh, so I established Czech Hemp as a 
put people who want to do better for him in Czech Republic together. But we did like hemp and medical cannabis. So it's all together now. Like, it's a one plant. Oh. And uh, yeah, and I we was able to lobby. We was able to lobby for 1% THC limit because we wanted to give farmer more comfort if this THC overgrows 0.3. We still not go to the jail because we have a lot of problems with the farmers having like problems about uh about like over like 0 0.35 and they already was like facing like courts you know for years like for really like come on like so we was like and then like go to farmer asking him like do you want to grow hemp i don't know i don't know like i cannot control the the mother nature and the plant if they go over 0 0.35 and I don't like this kind of, you know, risk style. But like now it's better because one percent it's kind of, you know, like giving enough tolerance. And uh the also I just the law law for for like C B D growers a little bit. Uh and we also like put there like can be used for food, like so before wasn't there really food on the industrial. Yeah, so and there was a way, yeah, industrial, it's like building, not uh, like food, yeah, it was come on, mm -hmm. like, yeah. in the industry, it's also industry, yeah, so really? it was like always oh, kind of like discussions. So we, yeah, so we decided to, uh, to lobby, lobby for that. Now we're lobbying for recreational cannabis, because we have okay. like very good national drug coordinator in Street Bobozil. And he's like very open minded. He's like long time on this position. So, so with him, we can do it. As so now he's like connected to the government leader party, uh, Democrat party. So, yeah. So always regulation and the, the moving forward. Step by step. So you, you have a lot of members. Uh, for your Czech hemp uh, organization, you it's, it's attracting more participation, or is it uh, mostly or largely yourself? No, no, no. It's like thirty companies. We have also universities. We have individuals. Okay. We have yeah. uh, small enterprises. We have middle-sized enterprises. We have medical cannabis. Industrial have like insulation producer, tea producer, uh, food producer, CBD producer, medical cannabis producer, consultants, like tech companies, like food research institute, like Czech University of Life Science, like everybody. We are like member, we are cluster, we call it cluster. Um, and cluster is proper, um, uh, organization which not allows only like cover uh not allow only like private sector but private government and the research so we are this right. triangle and we are able to access some funding from eu for clusters development oh is it okay so this is why we established cluster and we are also a member of the national cluster association which has like different cluster air cluster space cluster Creative cluster, furniture right. cluster, uh, whatever, like automotive cluster, yeah. all different clusters, nano cluster. So, uh, so we're working together, we meeting, we can, you know, do some project together. So it's interesting to have this kind of cluster, right. network, proper cluster network. So we do exchanges, we have a project around the euro, we do exchanges, so we're visiting each okay. other. It's good. It's good. It's it's not easy to run NGO and run business. Right. I'm the president and I have a manager. So it's um uh, manager is good. And mm -hmm. we have like with a team which working on the projects and like members. So I should be representative raw. Right. I think I'm still a little bit like more more involved that I should be, but it's okay. But it gives you... team, so they need to uh, get into and then probably I can be more representative. 
Right. But anyway, your bandwidth gets taken away by your business and consulting and all other things as well. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Hannah, uh, are there people who have influenced you to be the person that you are today? Uh, sure. Sure, definitely. There was my friend who started this NGO in Czech Republic. So, without her, I will be probably not where I am today. She's still my friend. Of course, friend. So, so it's good. Even she does not work in this anymore. Uh, then I had the uh, Dion Merkrat, my friend from US, who unfortunately died. But he was like big hamster. He had like first hemp shop in in uh, in uh, Amsterdam in like early nineties. He was from San Diego. Uh, there is a Step Scherer, who founded the American for Safe Access, a close friend, he established the ICCI, uh, it was the Institute for Research in Czech Republic on Cannabis. She does a lot of like advocacy for patients, so she teach me a lot about like how about like how the policy works and how the advocacy works. Uh, I had uh, people. In um, in Czech Republic too, like the Pavel Kubu, the medical cannabis doctor, who I'm like working on all the policy like 25 years. I have a Kenzie Zemoli, the guy who teach me, and Michael Kravitz. These two guys teach me a lot about the international policy. So we did a lot of lobbying on the United Nations. Uh, the farmer, I've been like working from the farm, Joseph Sklenas. He teach me a lot about farming and business. Now I have a good uh, new partner, Michael Marchuk. He worked on the scale up hemp operation in Ukraine and potentially uh, like in Europe, establish some more. He's a great person and good, uh, good, very high. <laughs> good uh, a business person. So he teach me a lot about business. That's good. Uh, yeah. So there was Paul Benheim from Australia, who established like one of the first uh, health food companies there. He was also very inspiring. Uh, the guy who who organized Noco Expo in the US. Uh, Maurice Beagle, he did a lot of like networking and putting people together, what I really like, but he does it very professionally. <laughs> so next year, hopefully, we will be able to do some, some events in Europe together. So I'm looking forward. It was always inspiring to go to his shows and meet all the people and see how he does it for the people. So, yeah. So, yeah, many people. It's like the really uh, little <laughs> world, yeah. So. No, that, that's nice that you could uh, draw out so many names. Uh, so clearly, uh, you, you are a, uh, uh, you, you do believe in the sense of gratitude to thank and recall and thank because most times we tend to group them and say, yes, I'm grateful, but stating is so important. So, uh, uh, Hannah, you already mentioned one book that you read about uh, hemp. Are there any books or documentaries or films that you, or podcasts even, perhaps you want to suggest uh, to our uh, listeners and audience they could probably look up um, that you follow? I, yeah, I follow the Maurice Bickle, Let's Talk Hemp. Uh, I follow the... Mandy Global Hemp Association because there is a lot of networking because I have a company in US. I sell hemp seeds in US with our Conopy US company where we are like four people. So um, I have to a little bit like follow what's going on in US. So and Mandy does this Global Hemp Association which is mostly like hemp people from US, not many from other countries, but they also like appreciate my expertise from Europe. So I like to be on their meetings time to time. I follow the work of the European Industrial Hemp Association, which does a great job in Europe. And I'm 
I'm on their meetings. I uh, I follow a lot what's going on in Nepal and India because I would really like to do something there one day. How do you follow? Is there any particular uh, 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 platform that you follow them on, or with the uh, individual you know, kind? I have a like I have a not really platform. I have this company ship. Uh, 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 Biraj and Nivadita in, in Nepal, so they, they do hand building. And I came in 2016 to help build the, their hemp, first hemp house, uh, from hemp shives. Uh, so, so I follow them, what they do, and, and we tried to, right after COVID, do some, some, some like advocacy on the government, but then, like in Nepal, it was a little bit like later that like COVID take it over. So on the beginning, everybody fired. So they were like, yeah, they do have something. And then they have the COVID somehow like make them super busy. So nobody had time. And, uh, but they, they do good stuff. So, so we're trying to work uh, with some another humanitarian organization from Czech Republic on some like project to, to, to build like local, local center for uh, hemp production and we did two international summits. I do follow Hemp Today, which is a good platform for hemp, hemp news mm -hmm. from all hemp sector. Gerd Reyer, it's a, it's a guy, we did a lot of small or big uh, events, small because he owns some small building in a, or big building in a small village in the middle of nowhere in Poland, where we always brought like hamsters from around the world, discuss under one roof for three days some topic on ham, which is great. We don't do that anymore after COVID, but it was a good, good times. And we did two conferences about industrial ham in Nepal, in Kathmandu. This is why I follow a lot uh, on, on, on Nepal, because it's more country. It's similar to India, but it's smaller, so it's easier to work with like government levels. <laughs> it's not so many. Uh, so, and also there is a more, more hemp, I would say, than in India because the people like traditional, like the traditional use. It's still, right. Still, still uh, not all over India, but some parts of India. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know, but you know, India it's too big. Yeah. So, so, uh, but I see important to, to, to one day really establish the project India, Nepal, Bhutan, you know, because there it's like hemp natural ground and nobody really, you know, like using it. Like Bhutan hired two Czech guys to do project uh, for like figuring out the insulation for their like stone houses. And it was like important, importing like plastic waste from India to do plastic wool insulation for Bhutan houses. And he was okay. sending me picture from my like, health field. Hey, look, like, this is just like what's growing here. And I was like, well, difficult, yeah? Because there is all the religion, like monks, they don't like cannabis because like the United Nations make a drug, so now they don't want to like do anything with the drug. You know, complicated. Oh, um, well, so uh, it is a bit complicated. I've been doing some research. Uh, it's ironical that people say, or uh, the history says, that uh, the Europeans came to India for uh, uh, our uh, 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 well, well, I'm just forgetting it. What uh, spices, right? Uh, but uh, if you actually look at it, or uh, read between the lines of the history. Uh, it looks more like they came for uh, 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 at least the British uh, and the Dutch. See, they were primarily coming to India because India was growing a whole lot of marijuana here. So they basically got more people to grow it and take it and sell it to China because they wanted tea and other things out of China. They initially didn't look at India for anything else. In the process, they realized that Indian... Uh, chieftains and whole lot of kings had a lot of gold and a lot of wealth. Then they decided to, you know, take more of all of it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. initially, I think it was primarily uh, Maruana that they 
originally came to India, and if you look at uh, the two uh, wars that pretty much destroyed China, also right, uh, 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 where uh, it was all going out of India. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, uh, then they tried to that. save India by banning it in India, and they set fire to it, and they forced potato on Indian farmers to grow potato, and they exported potato and rice also to support British armed forces for the World War One and World War Two. So it was it was uh, funny. So if you look at it, that uh, uh, much of subcontinent those days Nepal, Bhutan, all of it was part of one subcontinent. Right, India. Yeah. So much of it, including Afghanistan, all of this yeah. used to grow significant amount of hemp. And obviously, those days, I think people were used to getting more products out of hemp rather than just yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. opium out of it. So uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that, that that's one of my like probably uh, where I want to be in like next ten days. Uh, there are the regulation in in Europe. Yeah, I'm still working on the novel food with AHA and the recreational cannabis in Czech Republic. So it's still some something to do here. But when it is all done, which is like five years no more, um, I want to really like go India, Nepal, and these like Asian countries because uh, I w- I would like to work on the like protection of these varieties because oh. those varieties are there like many years. I work with Nand- Vandana Shiva. Uh, as oh, okay. she do this work on the seeds for grain. She does similar to kind of stuff. Similar. <laughs> right. I already talked to her about that. I met her on one expo in Europe. And she was like, yeah, come to my center. I was like, okay. But like, since then, I've never been in India. Uh, so, because then COVID hit, hit and then I'm just like stuck here and busy. But I, I really want to do it. I think it's very important. I think it's very important because people from India and Nepal, they're asking me, oh, can I import? Because I trade seeds under my company, right? Hemp seeds, like certified hemp seeds, yeah? Right. It's low THC. So uh, people from India, they, they're thinking, oh, maybe we can do something about industrial hemp. You import the hemp seeds, yeah? But it's not right, like, really will work, yeah? Because, like, first, different latitude, yeah? Correct. Like, Correct. Hemp is very photosensitive. And different so soil, different work. conditions, different weather, different. So, 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 so whether it can adjust, but the photo period is something very important. And and then uh, we don't want to, because you have the national, national varieties, national strains, which was never really described it. Yeah. I remember I visited the. Uh, with my with my friend uh, Shantanu Mishra, he has a uh, uh, hemp industrial association in India in Delhi. So we travel around uh, the 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 India a little bit. Oh, more like we went to the, from Delhi to the north, Dehradun. So we visited the university in Dehradun, uh, and the time they was like still building it. So, but they had the hospital, they had the Ayurveda medicine, you know, because it's Ayurveda uh, University. But, and they were like, like, really like, you need cannabis. It's in so many recipes of Ayurveda. You really need it. It's like one third of the recipes in Ayurveda. It's some, something with cannabis. Like how we, Ayurveda University can work without that. Can you help us? So we went to the government, we talked to them, but uh, I, it was like, you know, it, it needs to be like, like one European lady cannot like fight, fight the, the Indian government. It's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> like basically, because you never get enough high and everybody like, who you able to talk? Ask you for money before even like he will do something for you. And I was like, I'm not going to corrupt you, bro. Like, this is not my way. I'm here. <laughs> so, so it wasn't really, you know, for, for my European like standards, I couldn't, I couldn't like accept the way like the, the, the Indian like officers was like expecting me to work with them. I was like, no, go on. Like, <laughs> so, so I, I, I need to find some. Uh, or we need to somehow, you know, for India, like... Well, uh, uh, like everywhere, now. some parts of India are surely like that, yeah. Only but, do uh, it regional, and then right. in the region, 
find the right people who will be like strong enough to be able to communicate well with the government, just on the regional level, always regional level, even like in France where they do a lot of hemp, it's always regional level. Because in the end, hemp is a natural source which comes from the earth and you need to lose it, use it if you want to do it sustainable. Correct. Not like on the other part of the of the planet, right? So absolutely. So, so always locally and always, uh, always uh, with the people from the local municipalities Correct. because they know and explain them how you can, how they can benefit. But it's very easy, especially in India. There is so much textile production. Everything comes from textile producers in India. Like we need like ten containers a week of hemp fiber. I was like, yeah, you should grow it. <laughs> like importing <laughs> hemp fiber to India, it's like really, oh my god. It's a joke, yeah. It, it's a yeah, tragedy. Sure. But it is grown here and uh, there are laws, but which are uh, primarily restricting the growth of these things only for medicinal uh, purpose. So, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, there are some. Uh, yeah, right now, so far, the legal recognition is only within the medical uh, domain, yes. if you will. Yeah, uh, yeah. but like people... India should understand that it's like great material source and Sorry. yeah so I, I Hannah I just wanted to ask you before we close this section yeah uh, no matter which part of the world I think uh, hemp still gets eyebrows go up right uh, uh, so how do people react to you when you say you you are in this business? I mean, when you talk to people outside of your circle, mm, yeah, different. Sometimes they don't know what I'm talking about, so I tell them uh, they they think cannabis, and I was like, oh, not really cannabis. I do like clothes, and I do like building. Oh, what building? So then I start <laughs> explaining building then. Oh, what else? Paper, okay, they understand paper, uh, plastic, plastic, really? Plastic, no plastic, you know? So, so I did it's conversation like half hour because they're curious, you know? So it's, it's much better than the anti-nuclear uh, <laughs> activists, <laughs> you know? Because the people, they don't want to know about it. Uh, uh, yeah, so usually they react positively. Oh, okay. They react positively. Some people, they don't. But it's their problem, yeah. But I always talk to the people. It's a material source. We need local material sources. We have this green deal in Europe. We have the bioeconomy. We have our sustainable development goals, you know. So it's like everything important, you know. Uh, and if we want to, like, or we, like, we will figure it out, like, you know, but like our children, you know, they are more important. Like, <laughs> and how they will live in this palace, you know, like we have like 48 degrees in Sicily you now. It never happened before, you know. So like how how we figure it out, like how we how we do better, like like we're humans. We always should like be looking to do things better, yeah? Like we born here, our life it's a big school. And we should like be here to to learn and 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 do better and and teach our kids how to do better, no? Like how to improve yeah. ourselves. I think yeah. the degradation of humankind is still happening, and I would like to somehow I don't understand why. Yeah. So like, if we can do better, like why we don't do better? So so I think like help is something like that can help people do better, and many people finding it out, investor finding it out, people turning, okay, I want to do better, so I, I do something in ham sector. Yeah, not everybody in ham sector does better, sometimes they get worse, but it's just, you know, like humans are humans, you know, never will be everybody great, yeah. So people oh. doing mistakes, but people also learning a lot, so I'm here to provide people learning in hemp industry and sharing my experience, so uh, and Wonderful. I like to do. Yeah, because I don't like people to see them fail. I saw many people fail in my life. It's, it's, it's like my heart crying because some of them was wonderful, but they just didn't ask enough questions. So I always tell people like, ask enough questions before you start any business and ask the right people <laughs> the questions and 
a bit of pay consultants to tell you sincerely. Don't think like you can figure it out because without experience, it will cost you a lot of money. More than you pay the consultant. Good, good salary. Yeah. So that's true. So, Wonderful. Anna, thank you so much for uh, sharing this. And before uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we, I like to talk to you further about uh, uh, the, the business side of the whole thing. Uh, I'd like to, well, uh, uh, thank the uh, our audience and listeners. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this conversation as much as uh, uh, I did. And uh, do come back soon uh, and uh, come up for the second part of the conversation with Hannah. And uh, until then, don't forget to subscribe if you have not subscribed, it, uh, subscribed to Future Path yet. <coughs> and do share it with all your network. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and hope to next time be able to talking just about hemp in India. I have many thoughts. <laughs> so uh, looking forward. Thank you.